light out everybody what's up everybody welcome back to another episode of the lights out podcast i'm your host josh as always i'm joined in the studio by my producer joel and today we're going to be talking about some very interesting and sometimes just downright terrifying ufo encounters that people have had it's been a little while since we've dove into ufology it has and talked about some of the encounters that people have out there in the world and I still have yet to have a UFO encounter and it, it makes me sad every single day. <laughs> I bet. I'm in the that's same That's all boat. I want. That's yeah. all I want is to not only see a UFO, but I would love to be taken by one. As weird as that sounds, and Kendall always gives me shit for that for saying I'd want to be taken <laughs> by a UFO. But I honestly do, because that'd be such an experience. But I guess as long as I come back, right? Yeah. I mean, most cases, they do come back. They so. do come back. But do they come back unscathed? That is the question. But before we get into the episode, I wanted to quickly remind you that you can support the show for free by subscribing to us on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and then following us on Spotify. It does really help us out, and it just helps our show grow and the rankings and all that good stuff. So if you haven't done that already, we'd really love it if you went and did that right now. Pause the show. Go do it before you forget. But also, I wanted to remind you that my CBD company, Higher Love Wellness, is still out there. And recently, we have brought back our absolutely delicious cbd vape tanks yay finally finally got it figured out the only deal with it is that you have to be 21 and over or have somebody 21 and over place the order for you because the usps will require a signature when your package gets delivered but as long as you're 21 and over you should have no issues and our cbd tanks are 100 thc free and they don't have any additives or any nasty shit that's going to fuck up your lungs or make you sick or anything like that it's pure cannabinoids in there so it's just purely extract from colorado grown hemp there's really nothing to worry about with it i use it every day it really just helps keep you calm and i love it because it's not psychoactive so it's not going to get you high or make you feel funny you can fully work throughout the day using cbd and you know vaping it and there's no issues whatsoever which is really really nice plus the flavors are great we've got blueberry og watermelon haze and pineapple express of course so if you haven't checked out higher level wellness yet go ahead and do it after you listen to this episode, it's higherlovewellness.com and Lights Out listeners get 10% off. We also ship internationally as well, which is cool, uh, to a select number of countries, which all that info is on the website. But yeah, check it out. Also, merch is on the way. We've got the new collection completely done. It's going into printing now. We're finishing up the final touches on the website and I'm hoping to launch at the beginning of June. I know I've been saying this over and over again, it's coming soon, but it really is coming soon. And I hope within maybe the next week or two to be able to give you guys a sneak peek at what the new collection looks like that'd be awesome it's fucking awesome fire the designs came out better than ever i think you're gonna really like it and i think you're gonna get a lot of questions from people off the street of like where'd you get that merch because see that it's honestly that cool i think straight up fire it really is cool also something else we're working on is a exclusive lights out plush toy which if you're interested in plush toys, they're kind of cool. They're kind of cool mementos. And it's going to be a very, very limited edition toy. So there's only going to be so many of them and it's only going to be for a very limited time. And I'll have more information on that coming soon. I'm excited for it. It's going to come out really, really cool. And and there'll be more on that hopefully here in the next couple of weeks as well. So lots of fun stuff happening with Lights Out. We're going to be diving into a ton of different paranormal stuff going forward. We'll probably sprinkle in a little bit of true crime, but we're really going to kind of take the show into a very uh, paranormal direction. Yes. Um, Just because there's so much to discover. There's so much to uh, just look into in the paranormal world between aliens and UFOs to cryptids. Uh, I absolutely love looking into cryptozoology. It's really interesting. All those topics are what you and I are most interested in. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's what Joel and I have been interested in since we were young. I mean, we used to watch you know, all the paranormal movies and documentaries mm-hmm. together and haunting this, haunting that. And that's really what we wanted the show to be about. Lights Out was really supposed to be a paranormal focus show. And obviously I want to sprinkle a little bit of true crime in there. And so, yeah, it'll be mostly paranormal, but we'll obviously have a little bit of true crime here and there. And the true crime that I do cover them is going to be hopefully more cases that you haven't heard of before. And that is got maybe some paranormal elements to it so yeah so hopefully that sounds good to y'all 
I think it's going to be better for the show. It's going to be better yeah, for the same. overall experience. Joel has tons of fun editing these episodes. And Hell yeah, especially the paranormal ones. <laughs> <laughs> They're honestly downright creepy. Yeah, man. And I lo we love seeing the comments of people that are like, you know, I'm listening to this alone at <laughs> yeah. night and I had to turn it off right. because it was just so spooky and, yeah. and creepy. And that's really what we're, we're all about here. We want to create that spooky and immersive experience for you so you can really just listen and escape. Like, I want this to be an escape for you. I want you to be able to put on lights out and feel like you've been transported somewhere else. Absolutely. <laughs> and you're right there along with us experiencing this firsthand. So that's what we're trying to accomplish here. And hopefully that sounds good to you. But let's go ahead and get into the episode. Thanks for listening to everything. And I know I mentioned a lot of these things over and over again, especially higher love. Just know that these are all things I pour my blood, sweat and tears into. And when I'm not working on podcasts, I'm working on that company. So that's why I bring it up all the time. I know it annoys some of you, but you know what? I work hard at all these different things and I want to share with you. So thanks for listening and let's go ahead and get into the episode. Only in the past century have UFO encounters reached the mainstream. Since then, a variety of different stories have come to light. And from all of these stories, one thing's for sure. If you're ever out in the countryside and strange objects with bright lights descend on your location, you might be in for a rough night and you'll be lucky to come out unscathed. So our first UFO encounter has to do with a man named Robert Taylor, and it happened on Deckmont Hill. This first story has convinced many into believing UFO encounters and the fact that they are definitely real, especially because the man involved had nothing to gain, and he was always known as an honest man. On the morning of November 9th, 1979, Robert Taylor, a 61-year-old forestry worker, and retired war veteran got a call about a possible intruder in a nearby forest. So he drove his truck down a country road in Livingston, Scotland. It was a quiet road just off the M8 motorway. He pulled over to the side of a forest area just north of a hill known as Deckmont Hill, or Decky, as the locals called it. His red settler dog named Laura rode along in the passenger seat. And as they headed into the forest, they came upon a clearing among the fir trees. And what seemed like just another normal day was about to take a very strange turn. About 12 yards across the clearing, Robert saw an object he had never seen before. It looked like a circular metal object floating slightly above the top of the trees. It was made of dark, shiny metal. A detailed rim ran around its center, and several legs were attached to the bottom that looked like landing gears. As he got a better look, he could make out the rough texture that the surface was made of. And it almost looked like sandpaper. It floated above the trees for some time until a strange clunking noise came from inside the machine. After the noise stopped, he noticed two objects had been ejected from the main craft. He later said that they looked like Second World War naval mines, as they were metal spheres covered in six spikes each. As he checked them out from a safe distance, they began rolling across the ground and headed straight towards him. They made a very strange humming noise against the ground as they moved. Each spike planted into the ground as it rolled and their speed accelerated. As this is coming at him, he's thinking, I probably should back away. But these objects were way too quick. As they approached him, they anchored themselves into the ground with their spikes. And a small compartment opened and shot a wire towards him. At the end of each wire was a spike that attached itself to his pant legs. Robert tried to back away, but the wires pulled him to the ground. The two spheres then pulled themselves towards him and attached to his legs. He could feel an intense pulling sensation on his entire body. It felt like he was being pulled towards the main craft along the ground. He tried to grab at the grass and dig his fingernails into the dirt, but he couldn't move. He couldn't control any part of his body. It was like his entire nervous system was completely detached. Even as he tried to scream for help, his vocal cords wouldn't work. Then a hissing noise came from the spheres and a misty smoke filled the air around them. He could smell some sort of gas released from the small spheres attached to his legs. As he tried to gag at the horrific smell, his body went limp, and he began losing consciousness. The last thing he heard was his dog Laura barking as the hissing noise continued. A black haze took over his vision, and soon he was completely unconscious. The next thing he knew, he woke up in the middle of the clearing. His dog was still barking in the distance. The two spheres attached to his leg were now gone, and the main craft had vanished from the sky. As he tried to pick himself up from the ground, he noticed how sore his legs were. 
and as he looked around, he tried to calm his dog down, but he had lost the ability to speak. His whole body felt disoriented, and he struggled to walk back to his truck. Luckily, the truck was right where he parked it, and as he got inside with his dog, he inserted the keys, but the engine wouldn't start. The engine wouldn't even turn over. It was almost like the entire vehicle had been drained of energy or possibly sabotaged. After failing to get the car started, he decided to walk all the way home with his dog. It was a long journey and it was still difficult for him to walk, but luckily he finally made it home and his wife Mary was shocked at his torn clothing and the several cuts and bruises along his arms and face. When she asked him what had happened, he bluntly said he had been attacked by a spaceship. She was obviously shocked and had a what the fuck kind of moment, but she knew her husband was an honest man. Unsure of what to do, she called her husband's boss Malcolm and she told him what had happened. And even though the story was ridiculous, even his boss knew that Robert wouldn't make up stories like this, as he had no reason to. So Malcolm ordered a search of the area where Robert claimed he was attacked. A few other forestry workers headed into the clearing between the fir trees, but when they got there, they didn't see a damn thing. The Livingston police later showed up to Robert's house, hoping to figure out what had happened. As far as they were concerned, his shredded clothes and his cuts and bruises were evidence of an assault. So they started to treat this situation like a crime had occurred. They escorted Robert back to the scene where he had been attacked. And as they searched the grounds, one of the detectives found a strange ladder-shaped impression on the ground. They also found two rows of holes where Robert said he was attacked by the spiked spheres. Police later sent his torn clothing off for analysis, and they determined that the damage had most likely come from a machine-like object gripping and pulling him. And as far as he could tell, Robert was telling the truth about his assault. And his story never changed, no matter how many times they questioned him. Although they didn't believe that he was attacked by an alien spaceship, they did believe he was attacked by something. They just couldn't figure out what. So they opened an official criminal investigation. They tried to match the marks on the ground to the machines and vehicles used in the forest by the forestry workers. The ground had been soft and wet from the rain, so the markings would have been easily identified. But none of the markings matched. They also looked into the flight records of the airspace over Livingston, but no helicopters or small airplanes were reported in the sky that day, and in the end the police couldn't explain the attack, and they had no reason to doubt anything that Robert had told them. His story lined up with the little evidence that they found, and everyone who was close to Robert said that he wasn't the kind of person to make things up. But the police weren't about to admit that they had an alien assault on their hands. After the official police report made the news, the public became very interested in Robert's encounter. Many were quick to jump to conclusions and several theories have come to light throughout the years. Skeptics have suggested that Robert might have suffered an intense illusion due to epilepsy, but Robert hasn't had any medical history of seizures or epileptic fits. And even if it was a one-time seizure, it's highly unlikely that he would have had the energy to walk all the way home after it happened. Others wondered whether the ship he saw in the sky was some sort of top-secret military vehicle, but there's no explanation of where it came from or who developed it. And nothing like Robert described has been made public in the decades since the attack. Of course, there are many who believe that the whole thing was just a hoax, set up to attract UFO enthusiasts to the area, but the area had no reason to benefit from tourism. The region had a stable economy, and they didn't have anything to gain from the attention. One of the last theories claims that the markings on the ground were from equipment used by water authority workers in the area. But when these workers were questioned, they all claimed that none of the equipment was near the area where Robert was attacked. Still, theorists believe that the workers lied and used the area to store equipment without permission. But Robert has been to the area many times, and he had never seen any of the water authority workers' equipment in the area. In the end, there's no doubt that something strange happened to Robert Taylor in the woods near Decky Hill. He's made almost nothing financially from his encounter, and he never tried to get any money from his local fame. If anything, he became annoyed at the popularity. So many believe that he had nothing to gain from telling people about his encounter with the strange objects. And those that knew Robert always said he was an honest man. Unfortunately, as years passed without an explanation, Robert Taylor passed in 2007. His story is still unexplained, though, but Robert never changed his version of what happened that day out in the woods. His story was always consistent, making many believe he was telling the truth. 
And on top of that, other people in the area had claimed to see UFOs around the same time. Around 8 p.m. the night before Robert was attacked, a truck driver pulled a semi into a truck stop. He was headed towards Livingston when he saw a strip of brilliant lights in the air shaped like a ruler. Around the same time, two brothers named Stephen and Alan Little spotted a spherical object in the sky above Livingston. As they looked into the sky above their house, the object was nearly 1,200 feet away from them, hovering nearly 100 feet above a nearby road. They said it hovered there for several minutes before it slowly faded away into the black night. About two hours earlier, a group of friends witnessed a circle of lights rotating over the city. They figured it was a helicopter or a plane, but after they heard Robert Taylor's story, they thought it might have been the same spaceship that attacked him. On the same morning of Robert's attack, a man named Graham Kennedy was heading west on A-89. On his drive to work, he noticed an extremely bright light passing overhead. It looked like the object headed straight toward his car but at the last second it changed directions and disappeared. And at the exact same time, a nurse was walking towards a nearby hospital along A89. She was walking across the parking lot when a strange hissing noise came from above. When she looked up into the sky, she noticed a strange bright light soaring across the sky. It was headed towards the Decky Hill area. A bit later in the day, two women at a bus stop in town noticed a round, silvery object covered in flashing lights. All of these encounters seem to back up Robert's story. Skeptics say that people only believe they saw something in the sky after they heard about Robert's story, but believers say that all of these sightings prove Robert was attacked by a UFO. Unfortunately, his assault is still shrouded in mystery, but this UFO encounter is one that UFO enthusiasts have hung on to, especially because Robert Taylor had no reason to lie and he gained nothing from his terrifying encounter. So what do you think makes Robert's story believable? I think it's interesting that, I mean, obviously I don't know, I didn't know Robert, so I don't know if I can 100% believe the he was an honest man, but I'll take into account that everybody that knew him said he was honest, he didn't have any reason to make things up, the fact that he has nothing to gain from talking about this experience other than popularity, which seems like from all accounts, he hated. Yeah. And that's the thing too, is a lot of the people that end up experiencing things like this are the type of people that would never want to be thrust into the limelight. Mm -hmm. Obviously it's not true for everybody, but a large number of the people that encounter UFOs or have strange things happen to them just share their experience purely based on the fact of, I just want to say what happened yeah, to me. Yeah, you need to tell someone. It. Right, yeah, exactly. Absolutely. And when stories don't change, that's another good reason to, exactly. to believe the story. Made me think of Travis Walton. Right. When over the years you tell the story over and over again and nothing changes, you don't embellish things, you don't try to because he could have been like, Oh yeah, and then I met two aliens, right. you know, two greys and pulled me up into the spaceship. But no, it was just like it was he went unconscious and mm -hmm. that was it. Sounds like they're just giving the facts, no bullshit. Just right telling you how it is so with that i think you have to take that for what it is and you know if you want to be skeptical and be like oh well there's no physical proof then i'm not this is just bullshit then you know maybe open your mind a little bit because right. you don't necessarily need physical proof for every single thing in life to believe in it mm -hmm. or to believe that it really happens so for me i'm like this sounds like a completely believable story i mean Absolutely. it's it, makes absolutely no sense uh, what this thing was i mean it seems like based on his description this ufo had some very advanced capabilities oh yeah i mean it was not only hovering there but then it deploys these two spherical spiked objects that then roll on the i mean <laughs> i'm just thinking like how terrifying that yeah, must have been something you'd see out of a movie in like, a sense yeah exactly and, and and see you said out of a movie and people would take that and say that's because it is out of a movie joel <laughs> It's, it's this is made watch. up. This is just some crazy made up shit here that yeah. he experienced, and he just wanted to tell a good story. But right. it's like, let's push that aside and say this really did happen, mm -hmm. and let's examine what happened and and examine the the UFO that he saw and the the spherical objects in it. It's very different from a lot of other UFO stories that that we've covered and that I've heard of. I've never heard of spherical objects with spikes. Yeah, rolling not, not on the ground, no. being deployed from uh, you know, some type of UFO yeah. with lights. 
So that's very weird. It is. And but, I almost wonder what what the purpose of that was. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it was more like a warship or something Military like that. Military kind of seems more likely to me. Mm-hmm. I kind of get military vibes from this craft. More man-made. If it was truly something from out of this world, I, I tend to believe that those that can travel you know, across the universe don't need to like deploy physical objects to roll across the ground to like capture, uh, you know, what, whatever they were doing, whether they're grabbing some DNA samples or like they were just, they were attempting to abduct Robert. To me, this, this screams military, top secret military technology, or perhaps even a civilian who's created, created, you know, <laughs> some, wild. some yeah. random person out there who's created this object mm-hmm. and is like, testing it out i mean people over the years have created truly advanced you know there's a lot of engineers that just build shit out of their house yeah and so it's possible that it could have been somebody like that who built this this ufo looking device that could do have these capabilities and just kind of wanted to terrorize robert for some reason or he just happened to be kind of in the wrong place at the yeah. wrong time. And I feel like that's a really high possibility because how many other witnesses were seeing the same things and because what are the odds of someone seeing a UFO and then other people in the same area see it too? I mean, very slim. So, I mean, it could be like someone's machine kind that of they made with the yeah. town. Yeah. Yeah, and just just based off the description, I don't really believe from from what he saw that this was something from out of this world. It seemed like something from within the world, you know, something we've never seen before. There's no way to put a name to it. Sure. But some type of device that either the mil- some secret military group created or some civilian, really smart civilian yeah, made. Yeah, I agree. So that's a really interesting one, though. Yeah. But let's jump in to the next encounter. And this is about an individual named Terry Lovelace. Many UFO encounters around the world are often experienced by rustic countrymen and women out in the woods or in the middle of the desert, but many don't believe their claims. But what happens when a credible person with strong credentials makes the list? It's much harder to ignore. So Terry Lovelace was not only the Assistant Attorney General of the U.S. Territory of American Samoa, but also General Counsel for the LBJ Tropical Medical Center, President of the American Samoa Bar Association, a member of the Board of Medical Practice in Vermont, and Assistant Attorney General for Vermont. Most eyewitnesses are shrugged off when they claim they encountered something from outside of this world. But when Terry came forward with his story, people actually listened. In 1973, Terry joined the U.S. Air Force after graduating high school. While there, he trained as an EMT, and he was assigned as a base medic at Whiteman Air Force Base in Missouri. And his job was to drive an ambulance during the graveyard shift from 11 p.m. to 8 a.m. He also had a partner, only known as Toby, that rode around with him. In January 1975, they were out on their usual shift. Besides sitting outside the ambulance, there was nothing to do except look up at the stars in the sky. No calls had come in, so they sat back and relaxed. While they looked up at the sky, Toby put his amateur astronomy knowledge to use. He explained the different constellations and planets they were looking at. Many of their shifts ended up like this. Whole nights would even go by without a single call. But by 2 a.m. that night, it became the most interesting shift they had ever worked. A call came in reporting that a missile technician had fallen into a missile silo. He was about 18 miles away from the medical base across rows of soybean farms. So they hopped in the ambulance and drove off. When they arrived at the site, the place crawled with security police. Their ambulance was stopped and they were told to go no further. As Terry's eyes scanned the scene, he tried to figure out what was going on. As he looked up in the sky above the missile silo, he saw a black diamond-shaped object hovering. He said it was about the size of a van. It hung in the air for about 15 minutes before dashing off into the east. It went from a dead stop to the speed of a bullet in the blink of an eye. Terry and Toby were then debriefed and told they were forbidden to talk about anything they had just witnessed. They were also told that what they had saw was just an experimental helicopter, and they left it at that. But Toby and Terry knew that what they saw was definitely not some type of helicopter, but they couldn't do anything about it, and they kept their lips sealed. Two years passed, and Terry and Toby were still working the same shift at the medical base. They both took some vacation time to leave and go camping together. 
and they agreed to go to a place called Devil's Den. Since they were both interested in stargazing, the site was perfect. Terry also wanted to bring his camera to capture the scenery. It sat on a high plateau and it had plenty of nature and wildlife to photograph. So they packed up their stuff and drove out to the location. Since they wanted a better view of the sky and the scenery, they decided to go into an off-limits nature preserve area outside the main camping area. When they pulled their stuff out of the car, Terry realized he had forgotten his camera. He was bummed, but it would have been too much of a hassle to drive all the way back. So they got out of their tent, set it up, and planned to stay for two nights. On the first night, it wasn't long before they experienced a strange encounter in the night sky, one of many at Devil's Den. They returned from a hike that evening and were exhausted from the day. The long drive and setting up camp had wiped them out. At around 9 p.m., Toby looked up at the sky and saw three stars on the horizon. They looked like they formed a perfect triangle. The lights were small at first, and he noticed something strange about them. They moved together like they were attached to a solid object. The lights rose up in the air and grew bigger, and they both realized that the object wasn't growing. It was actually moving towards them. A black outline of the object blocked out the stars behind it, and the entire forest became dead silent. All the crickets and frogs that were once making noise had suddenly gone quiet. As the strange objects hovered over their heads, Terry and Toby suddenly felt drowsy. They didn't feel tired, they just felt more like they were drugged by an invisible dose of chemicals. As the object disappeared, they felt extremely tired, so they went back into the tent to sleep. But at 3 a.m., Terry woke up to multicolored lights that were so bright that they lit up the entire tent. The inside of the tent was so bright it almost looked like the night had become day. And as they scrambled out of their sleeping bags, they both thought it was a strange object in the sky that had returned. The bright lights flickered and danced around the tent as the tent shook underneath mysterious force. Terry pushed Toby aside and opened one of the tent flaps to look outside. They both looked out towards the meadow nearby, and hovering just above the land, they saw an enormous UFO, bigger than a five-story office building. It was the shape of a triangle and it had legs sticking out that were the length of a city block. The whole thing was nearly 50 feet tall and hovered 30 feet above the meadow. A low frequency based drone noise came from the ship. It was so loud he could feel it vibrating his skin. As the lights from the ship shined down on the meadow, they thought they saw children walking around the grass and a white column of light shot down from the center of the triangle and they realized it wasn't children walking around. It was tiny beings walking towards the column of light. As they entered the light, they dissolved until they were all gone. And the low bass drone frequency stopped as the light disappeared. On each corner of the triangle, bright white lights lit up the ship. And the craft began rotating slowly as it rose up in the air. It accelerated until it was high up in the air. And then with one final flash, it disappeared. After seeing what had happened, Terry and Toby abandoned the campsite and hauled ass back to the car. They started the engine and drove all the way back to the base, and when they returned, they noticed that their entire skin had turned red and raw, like they had a terrible sunburn. Their entire bodies were covered, even the bottoms of their feet, and they were so severely dehydrated, they ended up being hospitalized at the base for two days. While in the hospital, men came by saying they were from the Office of Special Investigations, or for lack of a better term, the men in black. They interrogated Terry and Toby in separate hospital rooms. They also told Terry that they had searched his car and his home for his camera, but he had told them he had forgot to bring the camera to the trip, so their search was pointless. After all was said and done, the men ordered him to never contact Toby again, and he was reassigned to another base. After being released from the hospital, the entire incident weighed heavily on Terry, and for the next several years he had intense nightmares, and he never truly recovered from the event. He became terrified of being outside in open spaces, especially after dark, and he started sleeping with a nightlight or a television on every single night. And he began keeping a loaded handgun on his bedside table with a high-intensity flashlight attached to it. As time went on, he began having strange psychological reactions to things. He began feeling uncomfortable around elderly Asian women for no reason. And any time he walked past a window display with mannequins, he began feeling anxious. He couldn't explain these feelings, but he knew it had to do with the UFO incident at Devil's Den. But the psychological damage wasn't the only thing he was left with. He also claimed that he had a spot on his leg that often went numb, 
In 2012, he had a small metal object removed. Even though there was no scarring on his leg, he was convinced it was some sort of alien implant. Today, Terry still practices law, and he has written two books about his alien encounters. Unfortunately, besides his old friend known as Toby, there are no other witnesses besides the agents that kept them quiet. But given Terry's credentials, many believe in his story. While skeptics think, you know what? It's just another hoax to make money from some book sales. Maybe. Maybe it's just a hoax to make money from book sales. I mean, I'd be interested to see if there's verifiable documents that can back up him being at the base, Toby being with him. But if we're going purely based off his word, I mean, the guy is a lawyer. Do yep. lawyers lie? Absolutely. They do. Lawyers can be very, very uh, slimy sometimes. They can, you know, kind of uh, bend the truth to do what's best Absolutely. for their clients. Right. It's all about winning the cases. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's really hard to say with this one. I mean, he saw tiny beings. That's interesting. And they dissolved into the light from the ship. But the, the, landing, the landing gears for the ship is interesting to me. I don't know. And a UFO as big as five-story office building? I That's feel like somebody huge. else would have had to have seen that at yeah, some point. Yeah, definitely. But, I mean, he did describe characteristics we've seen before, like uh, all sounds go mute. And they said they felt, like, sick when yeah. it was around them. So I don't know if that was a symptom of them slowing down time or speeding it up. And Yeah, it is weird. It's interesting. It is weird. It's definitely a, an interesting one. I don't. I don't know. I'm. I'm kind of fifty fifty with yeah. this one. I think. I think this one could potentially be be made up. I mean, the fact that he went and wrote books about it is a little suspicious. Obviously, mm -hmm. like you know, but it's like, what is it? He's a best, you know, New York Times bestseller. I don't think so. It's like, how much money is he actually making from from those books? Right. Could be. Or is very... it more to like you know? A lot of times, people write books and things to share their story because it. It's helpful to them right mm -hmm. it's helpful for other people to hear their story and so it's just one medium to do that right so maybe it's that but and i find it really sus that toby never really spoke spoken out about the experience and i don't know if that was plans because terry didn't want him to get any credit so he could take all right of that right is that credit for yeah. his books and or is toby even real right it's <laughs> i mean is toby he, even he a real person even be real so that I mean, I mean, there's a few things that make this one tougher to believe in for sure, and the fact that they were, you know, relatively close to an air force base. So you'd think if there was a five story office building sized UFO, everyone would see that. They, you know, the air force probably would have picked it up, uh -huh. and there would be other witnesses and reports that you know Definitely. are out there, you know, it, reporting this UFO, and especially if they're generating this low base frequency that was so powerful they could feel it on their skin i would think other people would too it is interesting though that the he went to the missile silo though and it was all rubbed off and they were told to not say anything about it because there there is actually like video evidence of ufos hovering over missile silos so hmm. that to me seems more credible um i don't know this one this one's tough definitely definitely let us know what you think of yeah. terry's story but i don't know i'm on the fence with it we're going to go ahead and dive into another encounter, that of Kelly Cahill. But before we do, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. Over New Year's this year, I had the opportunity to go to Cabo San Lucas in Mexico. And one thing that really helped me during my time there was the Babbel app. If you haven't heard of Babbel, it's the language learning app that sold more than 10 million subscriptions. Thanks to Babbel's addictively fun and easy bite-sized language lessons, there's still time to learn a new language before you reach your destination. With Babbel, you only need 10 minutes to complete a lesson so you can start having real-life conversations in a new language in as little as three weeks. Their teaching method has been scientifically proven to be effective, and with Babbel, you can choose from 14 different languages, including Spanish, French, Italian, and German. I've been catching up on my Spanish with the Babbel app, and on my way to Mexico, I listened to some of the Babbel podcasts, which were really helpful to sort of pick up some of the phrases that I might use during my time in Mexico. And honestly, it came in handy so many times for me. So if you're thinking about learning a new language, Babbel is an absolutely great place to start. And right now you can save up to 60% off your subscription when you go to babbel.com slash lights out. That's babbel.com slash lights out for up to 60% off your subscription because Babbel is language for life. 
Paying down debt can be stressful, especially when you need to keep track of multiple monthly payment dates. If you're tired of juggling due dates, consolidating with a personal loan could be your answer. That way you'll just have one due date a month instead of five, and Credit Karma can help you find the best option for you. Personally, when I got out of college, I had probably four or five credit cards maxed out, and I was paying tons of interest because I could only make the minimum payments, and I used a personal loan to consolidate that debt into one payment, and I think I paid off my debt in under a year for all five of those credit cards with way less interest than what the credit card companies were going to charge me for. Personal loans are a great way to get debt free. And Credit Karma uses your credit data to find loan offers that are personalized to you so you can have a better idea of what loan amount you can get approved for. Credit Karma will even show you your chances of approval, which is really nice. So you can choose between loan offers that you're more likely to get approved for and apply with more confidence. Comparing loan offers on Credit Karma is 100% free. It won't affect your credit scores and could save you money. Credit Karma, apply with more confidence today. So if you're ready to apply, head to creditkarma.com slash loan offers to see personalized offers. Go to creditkarma.com slash loan offers to find the loan for you. That's creditkarma.com slash loan offers. For many UFO abduction stories, most of them are missing one important piece that make them believable. Independent witnesses. Most of the stories through the years are firsthand accounts, which makes it very hard to trust the story of just one person. But in the case of Kelly Cahill, her alien visitation had several spectators. This made many UFO enthusiasts believe her account was the holy grail of abduction stories. But decades after the incident, some still struggle with what actually happened on August 7, 1993. On that cold winter night in Australia, Kelly and her then-husband, Andrew, drove along a country road in Nere Warren. They were on their way to a friend's house when Kelly looked out the car window towards a distant pasture. The land was dark after sundown and the hills rolled far and wide. But as she looked... Above the pasture, she saw something blocking out the night sky. Far above the pasture, she saw a row of five or six mysterious orange lights surrounding a circular object. It was nothing like she had ever seen before, and she almost didn't believe she saw anything at all. So they continued down the road towards their friend's house. When they arrived, she told her friends what she saw, but they just laughed it off. And when she saw the response, Kelly realized how ridiculous she sounded, so she laughed it off too. After a few hours at the friend's house, though, Kelly and her husband decided to drive home. Around midnight, they took the same road back and they passed the same pasture. But this time, the strange lights she saw were now hanging above the road. When she looked closer, she could see that the orange lights were actually windows on the side of this flying object. She could even see small figures standing on the other side of the windows. But before she could make anything else out, the object darted off and disappeared into the night. Moments later, it appeared again, hovering over another pasture. At that moment, Kelly's memory faded. A blank spot took over. For how long? She didn't know. Their car traveled a few hundred feet down the road without realizing what had happened. It felt like they had almost traveled through time. Minutes had completely disappeared from their memories. And when they realized something strange was going on, they looked out into the sky, and the strange object was gone. In the following weeks, Kelly began finding mysterious marks across her body. A small wound in the shape of a triangle appeared just below her belly button, and she began experiencing intense stomach pains. On one night as she slept, she woke up to strange flashes of light in her bedroom. When she sat up and looked across the room, she saw tall, black-hooded figures standing in the corner. Beneath their hoods, their eyes glowed red. With some unknown power, they put her in a state of hypnosis. And during her trance, she was able to unlock her memory from the night they drove home on that long country road. The memory came flooding back, and she saw that night in her mind's eye. Her husband had pulled over to the side of the road. They both stepped out of the car to get a better look at the strange object in the sky. A few hundred feet back up the road, another group of people had stopped their car to look at the object. They stood at the edge of a field watching the object land in the open pasture. Suddenly a figure appeared in front of the object looking straight at Kelly. She heard it speak, but the voice only entered her mind. It said, let's kill them. Several more figures appeared around Kelly and her husband, and a massive wave of invisible energy shot from their bodies and knocked Kelly to the ground. She screamed out to her husband in a panic, and this was the last thing she remembered from that night. After her flash of memory had come back to her, Kelly decided to reach out to Bill Chalker, a researcher from the UFO Investigation Center. 
As he listened to her story, Bill immediately knew there was something special about the case, but there was a lot to investigate. He then contacted a group of paranormal investigators called Phenomena Research Australia, and they went out to the scene where Kelly was attacked. They also put an ad out in the newspaper to try and find the other witnesses who were up the road that night. And luckily, they got a quick response. Not only did the other witnesses see what had happened, they still had their memories. They even gave a detailed account of what happened after they were all abducted. They remembered being taken inside the spacecraft and strapped to tables. The strange beings then examined them like lab rats. The paranormal investigators listened to each of their accounts, and they also claimed that all of them had strange wounds on their bodies. All the women had the same triangular wounds underneath their belly buttons, exactly the same as Kelly's. After more investigating, they even found a third car driven by a local lawyer who had also witnessed the events. After the team of investigators put the entire story together and investigated everything they could, they created a 300-page report detailing all the evidence they had found. And many believe this report would be the undeniable truth of a real alien abduction, and many called it the holy grail of UFO encounters. As the investigation gained steam, the media latched onto the story, and soon Kelly appeared in newspapers, magazines, and TV shows. Only three years after the event, Kelly had become a UFO celebrity, and during every interview, she would release a little bit of information from the 300-page report. She also published her book called Encounter that sold out immediately. It's now out of print and sells for nearly $200 online. The case gained so much traction, but as years passed, the report never came out. And by 1998, Kelly suddenly disappeared from the spotlight. None of the other witnesses, including her ex-husband, Andrew, backed up her story. Many UFO enthusiasts believed it was too good to be true, but they still wanted to know what happened to the 300-page report that had been hyped up for years. But as decades passed, the case faded away only to return 27 years after the fact. In 2020, the old director of the Phenomena Research Australia group said that the report might still see the light of day, but the paranormal group doesn't want to become the focus of the investigation. They wanted the actual witnesses to come forward. As for the report, Kelly and Andrew had asked for certain information to be removed. They didn't want their medical and psychological reports to be released to the public. So the report went from 300 pages to 100. Bill Chalker, the researcher that Kelly first contacted all those years ago, regrets giving the case over to the paranormal group. A lot of tension had grown between Bill and the paranormal group over the years, and he was disappointed in their excuses for never releasing the report. He promised to never hand them a case ever again. As for Kelly, she contacted Bill in the early 2000s. She sent him three large boxes of all the files she had on the case and then left the country. She wanted to put everything behind her, and she fell off the radar because she realized that none of the other witnesses were going to back her up publicly, including her then-husband, Andrew. And when the report was never released, she realized she was completely alone. Supposedly, she returned to her home in Gippsland, where she still lives today, but she keeps a low profile. Unfortunately, we might never know what truly happened that night in 1993, and many are still divided on the topic. Some still believe Kelly's encounter could have been a legitimate story, while others argue it was just all a big hoax. So there could be a number of different reasons why the other witnesses didn't want to come forward, including her husband. I think the biggest reason that sticks out is because this was all made up, mm -hmm. and why would they want to come forward on a made-up story and look like idiots. I right. think that's the like most glaring possibility. Mm -hmm. And I found it very sus that they weren't going to release the report, you know? Yeah. It's like, what are you trying to hide? There has to be something. Yeah, I mean, my only thoughts are potentially there's private information relating to her that they don't want to release for her own sake. Or, you know, it's just, it could kind of be the same reason that, you know, the Warrens don't release all of their findings and information as well sometimes especially paranormal groups kind of like to gatekeep their their information okay and if they have exclusive details about something maybe it's like you know you know it's almost like protecting your treasure i right? see what you're saying yeah and so maybe it is that crazy and that profound and there is all these sensitive things maybe there's things in there that 
yeah. might scare people. Sure. And so they're just kind of keeping it under wraps because they just don't want anybody else to look at it or they're trying to sort of piece it all together still. Maybe they're still working on it. Yeah. And I also found Kelly's description of the aliens like suspicious as well, how they had black hoods and glowing red eyes. Glowing red eyes. I never heard of that before. I've, yeah, we've never covered an alien with glowing red eyes or even black hoods because most of the aliens we've covered are either wearing a blue jumpsuit or an orange jumpsuit. So I didn't see any similarities with the appearance. Yeah, it, it sounds a little, <laughs> definitely sounds a little sus for sure. Yeah, almost like too sci-fi that yeah, it's not even very yeah, believable. Kind of reminds me of something like American Horror Story or something. Yeah. Like it's always hard to prove whether or not people can actually remember something too, right? Because the only person that can control their memory is you. Mm-hmm. And it's just odd that she was able to recall stuff, but then no one else could, and then. Other people's descriptions are kind of different. It seems, I don't know, it seems very weird. I mean, is there a possibility this was legit? Sure. But it's its interesting how she kind of took off too. Yeah. And maybe it was because this really did happen to her and people were just giving her so much shit about it that... She wanted to escape from yeah, all that. it's just difficult to deal with that over, you know, after a while. And if this is a truly traumatizing experience, I mean, it sounds horrible. Yeah and scary and so if it really did happen to her then maybe that's why she's trying to escape from it all and yeah but my thing is if this experience was truly this profound why would the aliens only come and visit her once like i feel yeah. like they would come back and you know yeah. see her again because why would they want to expose all of that to a person and then never pick them up again it's like i think they would want to pick them up again because they're already familiar with them and they can monitor yeah. what they're doing with the information. But yeah, good point. No, it's, it's just it's bizarre. Yeah. It's a very bizarre story. I mean, I it's another one where I'm like, I don't know, could go either way <laughs> here. Could. I mean, it's it's a weird one. I, I I'm a I'm usually not super skeptical, but like this one does. I was about to say that make yeah. me. Uh, I'm definitely way more a bit more skeptical yeah. on this one than the last two that we covered. So this leads us to the last encounter we're going to talk about today. And this next one was one of the earliest to reach the worldwide spotlight. And many argue whether the story was inspired by an old local alien magazine or if it was the real deal. Dating back to 1957, Antonio Villas Bojas was a 23-year-old Brazilian farmer. He was up late on October 16th working at night to avoid hot temperatures. He was out plowing his field when he stopped for a moment to catch his breath. And that's when he looked up at the starry sky above him and noticed a single red star, brighter than all the others. It was the same star he and his brother had seen the night before, and they both thought it was unique. But his brother wasn't with him now. He was alone in the dark field underneath the dark sky. As he kept looking at it, he noticed the star grew bigger. It wasn't until it was ten times bigger than the other stars that he realized it was actually an object moving towards him. When it got close enough, it looked like an egg-shaped aircraft turned sideways. It had a bright red light attached to the front and a dome on the top. It flew down to the field in front of him where it extended three landing legs. As it landed on his farm, Antonio turned around to run for his life. He passed through the field, hopped in his tractor and tried the ignition, but his engine cut out. He figured he had no choice but to continue his escape on foot. So he hopped out of the tractor and began running as fast as he could. But as he made a run for it, a five-foot creature appeared several feet in front of him. It stood calmly in the middle of the dirt path, and Antonio could tell it wasn't human. It wore gray coveralls and a large helmet, and had small bug eyes in its head that shined blue. Around its eyes, it wore a pair of large round glasses. It also had three silver tubes sticking out of its head. And when it opened its mouth to speak, it made grunting and yelping noises like a dog. Just then, three more identical creatures appeared and quickly surrounded him. He tried to defend himself, but they lifted him up by his arms with incredible strength. Surprisingly, Antonio's memory never faded, and he never fell unconscious. He remembered his entire experience in the spacecraft. Many abductees usually claim their memories were wiped, but Antonio remembered the creatures bringing him into a cold room and stripping him naked. They took his clothes and locked him into a room where strange red symbols covered the doorway. He tried to remember each shape on the wall. 
They were strange and didn't make any sense to him. He thought it might have been letters from a different language. Then the creatures took out a tube of thick, clear, odorless liquid and rubbed it all over his body. It was cold to the touch and he didn't know what they were doing coating him in this strange liquid. But he thought it might have been some sort of germicide. They then attached a mysterious apparatus to his chin and drew his blood. The machine left a small scar but didn't cause any pain. After they were done, the creatures threw him in an empty room with a small foam bed. The air in the room became hard to breathe, which made Antonio lightheaded. He thought they were pumping some kind of gas into the room through the vents, and he eventually vomited, which made him feel slightly better. Then moments later, a beautiful naked woman entered his room. She had platinum-colored hair, large blue cat-like eyes, and a narrow face. Her underarm and pubic hair were bright red and seemed to almost glow. Antonio thought she was the most beautiful creature he had ever seen, and as she approached him, she grabbed a hold of him. Her skin was softer than anything he had ever felt, and without communication, she looked into his eyes, and Antonio knew she wanted something from him. As he later put it, they wanted a good stallion to improve their stock. So they ended up having sexual intercourse twice. The whole time she refused to kiss him. Instead, she preferred to bite his chin. And she made growling noises like an animal. After they were done, one of the other creatures entered the room and called out to her. Before she left, she looked at Antonio and pointed to her belly. She then gave him a smile and pointed towards the southern sky outside the spaceship and then she left. Antonio interpreted the signs to mean she was planning on raising their child in space. But before he could make any sense of it, one of the other creatures gave Antonio back his clothes and led him into one of the rooms. A set of stools surrounded a table. Other crew members sat around and communicated with each other. They ignored him, and Antonio felt like he was in the clear. He was confident they wouldn't harm him since he was useful to their cause. Before he left, he tried to examine everything he could in the ship and remember it for later. In the room, he noticed a box with a glass top. It almost looked like an alarm clock. He noticed the clock had one hand and several marks around a circle. It looked similar to an ordinary clock on Earth, but he noticed that the hand didn't move as time passed, so it might have not been a clock at all. Regardless, he tried to grab it. He wanted something, a souvenir, to take back with him so people would believe his encounter. But one of the crew members noticed this and snatched the object and shoved Antonio away. They then escorted him off of the ship. As they set him down in the field, he turned back to look at the ship. The sideways egg-shaped vessel disappeared into the sky at lightning speed. When he checked his watch, it was around 5.30 in the morning. Almost five hours had passed and the sun was about to rise. He traveled along the field until he reached his tractor. As he got inside, it still wouldn't start. And when he opened up the hood, he noticed it had been sabotaged. The battery wires had been disconnected. The creatures were somehow smart enough to know how to disable machinery from Earth. And they were also smart enough to know that he would try to use a tractor to escape, which made him wonder how long they had been observing him. For months after his encounter, Antonio allegedly suffered from what looked like radiation poisoning. He also had symptoms of body pains, nausea, loss of appetite, headaches, and constant burning sensations around his eyes. His skin was bright red and constantly peeling. If his skin was even lightly brushed against, it would tear apart or bruise. Small red bumps formed across his entire body, and they felt harder than the rest of his skin. They were painful if touched, and constantly oozed yellow liquid. And when they asked him what had happened, he told them he was attacked by unknown creatures that came down from the sky in some sort of UFO. But of course no one believed him, so he reached out to a few local journalists interested in UFOs to see if anyone would tell his story. His account was passed around for years, and the earliest printed reference to his story was in June 1962 by a Brazilian UFO periodical. Many believed his story, and it happened years before the Betty and Barney Hill abduction, which brought the concept of alien abductions into the mainstream. But skeptics have claimed that Antonio took the story from a November 1957 issue of another Brazilian periodical and made it his own. Those that believed him said that a simple farmer wouldn't have been able to remember all the tiny details like Antonio did. They claimed he wasn't smart enough or creative enough to make up a story like that. At the same time, the skeptics claim that those tiny details are also what made his story sound made up. 
And while most abductees can't remember their abduction stories at all, Antonio remembered everything down to the last detail. And the debate over his story continues to this day. Wow. Yeah, wow. That's one for the memories, right? Oh, yeah. All the details is definitely suspicious because, again, like in pretty much every other UFO abduction story, and if you look at like Travis Walton, which I think is one of the most credible out there, like there's clearly some memory loss. I mean, you're stepping aboard a ship that has anti gravity abilities. Like, there's no way you're going to be able to remember every single no. detail. And the fact that these creatures are like, oh, yeah, why don't you just have a look around? No. <laughs> and like, it, it's just like such the classic story of like, oh, you know, there's a female, this hot, naked yep. <laughs> alien woman on board that I, that wanted to use me as yeah. her it, it kind of stud it's oh i know hilarious kind of reminds me of the american horror story season ufo where they it's all about the it's reproduction about, yeah. process but um obviously they blew a lot of things out of proportion but that that's the one thing that seems believable in this was his only purpose was for sexual reproduction or right wanting to make a hybrid alien human child yeah. which maybe sure i know but the fact that the story is found in another periodical and like the Betty and Barney Hill abduction is also another uh, credible one, uh, I believe, uh, I believe in. And when I first started researching that, I was like, is this the very first one in history? And it mentioned Antonio's story oh, and okay. everything that I've seen out there is like the consensus is that Antonio took this story from somewhere else that he read it and then kind of like made it his own at his own twist and, right and there's kind of a reason that antonio's story is not considered like the very first mainstream alien abduction story because it is very difficult to believe mm -hmm. and like he was out there with his brother the night before they saw this red star so they say and then the next night he's not there of course <laughs> yeah. to witness this right and shit just gets crazy really quick and and it's like also really the aliens are going to go disable your tractor battery <laughs> so you can't escape. You don't think oh, the I aliens know. can catch you in your track, no. like without a tractor? Yeah, tractors aren't even that fast. To yeah, begin like, with. So. what are you talking about? How fast your tractor go? Yeah. You got a turbo tractor. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a good story, mm. but yeah, it's uh, definitely one of the least believable ones that, that I find. But yeah, what do I know at the end of the day? <laughs> Right. You know, these are all, these are all, to me, this is all fun and, and interesting and Absolutely. intriguing. And that's, that's why I would do it. So let us know what your thoughts are on, on these UFO encounters and which one did you find the most credible? Which one did you find, you know, the most likely to be to bullshit? Be? Exactly. Yeah. Let us know in the comments. Let us know on social media. We're on, we're on, you can find us on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter at Lights Out Cast. We're going to go on and wrap up today's episode there. Thank you guys so much for joining us for another episode of Lights Out. And until next time, Lights Out everybody.